Hello. It's been a while since I did a video design thing, so I figured I would. Um, today I'm going to talk about some of the lessons I've learned from Kerbal that are a little bit less straightforward than you might think in terms of game design. Um, I'm pretty sure that the people who designed Kerbal, the guy who designed Kerbal, uh, wasn't thinking in these terms, but I've designed a lot of prototypes over the past few months that are similar to Kerbal in some way or another. Some of them have showed up on my YouTube channel as Let's Programs and others haven't. But uh, I've actually learned quite a lot about the nature of Kerbal as opposed to something like the nature of SimCity. So if you're playing something like SimCity, then you're putting down all of these buildings, uh, or rather you're putting down all these zones and, and buildings and they interact with each other. So uh, a lot of the gameplay is what buildings interact with which, and some of the buildings add to your city's total, whereas other buildings affect the buildings around them. Uh, so, you know, your industrial sector gives you cash but increases your pollution, and if it's too close to your residential center, then your residents will complain of pollution, uh, you know, stuff like that. And uh, the way that works is that there's a complex list of causes and effects and links and so on and so forth, and you get to things like, uh, the citizens demand fire protection, and you've got to put in some firehouses and, uh, and drive some trucks around, and then you've got to put in some police stations and drive some police cars around, and so it's all about fulfilling this complex web of needs that the game has hard-coded into it. And that can be fun. Um, and you get stuff like Evil Genius, which is about a combination of that and laying out really complicated topological traps. Uh, so you can have a lot of fun with those kinds of base-building games. But Kerbal's not like that. See, Kerbal has only one basic idea, and that is that there is a series of formula covering how f hard it is to get from point A to point B. And they say, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in order to accelerate, it's equal to mass divided by force, um, and then you've got a constant acceleration downwards if you're near the planet, and you've got a couple of things like air pressure keeping you, or, you know, air friction that keep you from going up, and then you can get into an orbit and transfer orbits. And all that stuff sounds very complicated, but in the end, it's just a couple of basic formulas governing how hard it is to get a certain amount of mass to a certain other location, and uh, whether you want to stop there or not. It's just a series of very simple formulas and they change a little bit depending on whether you're going through the air or what, but in essence, it's hit, there's no... The, the, the ship never says, uh, you know, I need a police station or my pollution is getting too high. There's just a very simple constraint. It takes a certain amount of force to get from point A to point B, and there are a certain number of, of other forces that may be in your way, like gravity. And this allows you to actually uh, have a different kind of gameplay. So what really matters is the weight of the payload, the mass of the payload that you're trying to put into space. So if you're trying to put in, if you're trying to put in just like a little probe uh, like this, you know, do 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 to Sputnik type thing, uh, then you can get into space relatively easily because that weighs not very much, right? But if you're trying to put this into space so that you can put the probe around Sput and so you can put Sputnik around the moon, then you need a larger rocket to get that up into space in the first place. So every time that you increase the number of things you want to do, your payload size goes up and you need a larger rocket to balance that out. And you start to get into, into situations where, you know, your your rocket is, is uh, wibbly-wobbly and you're doing this this crazy stuff where you've got all of these random engines everywhere and it's all shaking and vibrating and spinning like a top. Um, but these constraints, this situation here where you've got this overly complicated ship that you're not sure you can control, none of that is hard-coded in. Um, it never says, well, if you have a rocket that it applies this much vibrational force or anything like that, that you have to put a, a, a station, a cop station in or whatever. You don't have to, you don't have to ever it never forces you to do anything, and it never says that your rocket will be unhappy if you fail to do something. Instead, it's all about how you build the ship. So if you build the ship uh, in such a way that it has a little bit of spin to it, like, say, you connect the, the everything like this, uh, if you happen to build it so that it's got spin, then the rocket is going to spin as it goes up. And you can either try and fix that by putting in some SAS, uh, or perhaps putting in some fins, or both, or you can try and build your rocket differently so that it doesn't spin. 
Um, and there's a whole bunch of other things. You don't absolutely need to have solar panels on every single ship you send up. It depends on how you're going to generate juice, how much juice you have decided that you're going to need, and so on. So uh, Kerbal is very strong in that way. As you build yourself a rocket to get your payload into space, you have to consider how large is my payload? Am I actually building a rocket that needs to ha is is does my does my payload need a rocket to get it from point A to point B, uh, but does it need another rocket to get it from point B to point C? Because if so, that means my payload is larger. And you work out all of these details organically. Uh, at no point does it ever say, well, you you have X dollars to face Y challengers in Z minutes. Um, it just says, do whatever you want, and here are the formulas that restrict you, the constraints. This is very valuable, but it has one big weakness, and this is the weakness of Kerbal, uh, and that is that your payloads don't matter. Uh, in Kerbal, there is no advantage to actually landing people on the lunar surface. Uh, yes, you can put down yourself a flag, but it doesn't actually matter any. I mean, there's just bragging rights. It doesn't actually have any other effect. So uh, what payload you decide to send up into orbit is going to be something that you invent for yourself to try and make yourself happy. Um, a lot of these payloads make a lot of sense. You know, you might want to visit the moon. You might want to visit another planet. Um, that sort of stuff. Uh, those are those all suggest themselves very easily, which grows into a variety of payloads custom made for those sorts of situations. And you know, your lander gets to be looking different for every every planet you want to go to, depending on the sort of situation on the far side. But this stuff all has limits because there's no ongoing need. There's no uh, this means nothing to the game. It only means something to you. So I was starting to think, I was getting a little bit tired of Kerbal's lack of, uh, of, of payloads that matter, because none of the payloads matter. Uh, every single payload is just a matter of uh, getting something arbitrary from point A to point B, and if that requires another thing to get it to point C and another thing to get it to point D, you apply this recursive constraint system where your payload gets larger and larger and larger and larger, but at no point does your payload actually matter to the game. The game never never cares whether you land someone on the moon or whether you crash into the moon. Uh, it doesn't care whether or not you land a person or a probe. Um, it doesn't matter whether you've scanned something or not. There are some mods that help with that. For example, the Keythane mod will allow you to drill, and that actually is pretty cool. Um, and then there's some other mods that allow you to scan with satellites, and there are some other mods that allow you to set up communication relays that go throughout space and so on and so forth. So I was thinking, is there any way to make the actual thing that you send up into space matter? And of course there are lots of ways to do it. Uh, you can have it so that uh, when you send something into space, uh, it actually matters as to whether or not it can scan the, the ground. Maybe you get science points um, based on how much you scan various things. And maybe you can get a different kind of science points or more advanced science points from having a rover on the ground taking samples of rocks. Um, maybe you can get uh, uh, some kind of other science points for having someone who lives down on the uh, on the surface or does experiments while floating in space. Um, all of those might be able to give you something like a variety of kinds of science points. Another way to do it is to have uh, mining for resources where you can only get certain resources that off planet and therefore building that kind of system for mining something off planet and returning it uh, really matters. Uh, another option is you might have some other kind of uh, resource points like uh, uh, culture points or fame points or money that you get from your government from for successfully doing things. Uh, so there are a lot of options as to how to make payloads matter um, and there are even some more advanced ones if you really want to start looking. For example, there might be alien invaders that you have to resist. So if you want to land on planet X, then you have to build defenses as well. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Uh, protecting uh, payloads and so on and so forth. Uh, and then of course you've got the these, these Kerbals or spacemen or whatever you're doing. Um, right now they are always free but you might implement life support costs and that would then require some payload support um, 
and how you accomplish that payload supports okay. See, the big is up to you. Uh, so the big thing about Kerbal is applying just functions, func applying these simple um, mathematical functions. You know, getting to point from point A to point B is this hard in these situations. Um, that allows you to put in all sorts of different approaches and to mod it really easily. So, I mean, there are thousands of mods out there, uh, including engines that use different kinds of fuel and different kinds of, uh, of connectivity. Um, and then you've got, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of other mods that add in all sorts of different kinds of functionality. And all of those work great because there's nothing hard coded. Uh, uh, all it's it's just these formulas, and all of these things do is they, all these things do is they say, okay, well, we're going to come at these formulas from a specific angle, and I mean, sure, you can break the game and cheat, uh, and bypass those formulas with extreme ease by giving yourself infinite fuel or whatever, but um, the formulas still allow you to build all of these really complex and beautiful mods uh, very easily because they all just merge together at the same point. They all merge together into that formula and the formula can accept them. So all of that talk about resource points and uh, science points and so on, all of this is fine and dandy, but if it's hard-coded, then you can't get the full experience out of it because you can't really modify it very easily. You can't really approach it in a variety of ways. I mean, let's take science points, for example. How do you get science points? Well, let's say that we hard code it so that you get X science points for a specific device. So let's say that you've got a ship and it's got a science scanner attached to it and the science scanner provides you with X research points. But the problem is that that's not a formula. That's just a hard coded aspect of the game. Um, and sure, you could come out with a mod that gives you a different kind of science device. So this one only gives you 2 points per second, and this one gives you 15 points per second. But that's not really a fundamental change. Uh, that's just uh, a slightly different piece. Um, it's, it's not the same category as being able to change over to using uh, a different kind of fuel. For example, taking intake air rather than oxidants or being able to use uh, nuclear propellant. That sort of stuff it is, is awesome and this doesn't work for it. So what I'm thinking is, what if we make these inputs very similar to the idea of the engine? So you've got the rocket engine, right? It actually produces a certain amount of thrust. And in return, it takes whatever your payload is upwards by whatever the formula says. What if we do the same thing here? What if these science devices, these resource gathering devices, whatever we're gathering, what if instead of simply adding to a big bank, they're acting to accelerate another project? So what if we have some kind of, the, the idea of a payload would actually be some kind of new science project? And we would be able to say, uh, well, we want to get this science project off the ground. We want to accomplish it. And then there would be a formula that says, OK, well, it's going to be this hard to get that science project off the ground. And so then what you have to do is you have to send out enough science probes, basically, to, uh, to get it from point A to point B. So we're talking about physical payloads to support a non-physical payload. Uh, we're talking about. Uh, you have to get it from point A to point B, so maybe you need to send out a scanner to a specific planet to, you know, read bandwidth, uh, light, light bandwidth off of, uh, off of atoms scattered across the planet's atmosphere or something, and then you have to send out another uh, thing with a ram scoop attached to grab samples of that and then bring it back home. Um, and the idea is that you would have to gather a certain amount of, of resources. But this isn't a situation where, you know, uh, if you're trying to invent, uh, let's invent the proton engine. And then, of course, the game would say something like, oh, well, it requires uh, 10 radio search points and 15 proton research and 15 magic engine research, whatever. Um, that's not what we're trying to do here because this is, uh, this is a, a hard-coded set of goals and parameters. Instead, what we want to do is we want to have the research be 
a payload that can be delivered to various um, final destinations. So you're not inventing a proton engine. You are working on uh, proton propulsion in general. And then how you propel it with your various kinds of research and various kinds of materials will change where it can end up. And similarly, you're going to want to decelerate and stop at a specific point to get a final product that you're happy with. So that would be the equivalent, uh, you know, when, when we're talking about a physical payload, we talk about landing and not crashing on the moon. But when we're talking about a science payload, we would be talking about taking it from prototyping stages into production stages. And anyone who's actually worked on um, getting something into production stages can tell you this requires a lot of effort, and it's our equivalent to deceleration. So you can start to see, we can start to build the same kind of um, overall structure that our physical missions would have. So for a physical mission, you know, you'd start on the planet with atmosphere, and then you'd have to have a certain amount of force to get out of the atmosphere, and then you'd want a certain amount of force to get into orbit, and then round, and then you'd have a certain amount of force to get uh, from this orbit to the next orbit, and then you'd have a certain amount of force to land on the surface of the planet without crashing, and then maybe you even come back. And you can start to see that we can get the same kind of system uh, using the simple uh, idea of research, where you know you do a cert you do a, a feasibility study, which is the equivalent of getting out of the atmosphere, and then you do some uh, some kind of basic research, which is the equivalent of orbit, and then of course you do land, and then you do uh, landing, which is the equivalent of uh, uh, making it viable, uh, taking it to the market. market might be getting home and then uh, it might be uh, uh, prototypes might be landing and so on and so forth uh, and by designating a bunch of different possible uh, not really physical spots to do this stuff you can get the same kind of va variability so for example if you're building prototypes you might have a couple of different abilities places you could land uh, similar to being able to land on the moon or being able to land on the second moon or being able to land on Mars or whatever. Um, there are various places you can land to determine the size and type of your prototype. If you want a big engine, you might have to land someplace that's harder to land on or requires a different kind of research. Uh, so I don't know whether or not this would be a fun game uh, to, a fun thing to add to a game, but I do know that it's this, it can be made the same kind of function. So I'm thinking, wouldn't it be an interesting idea if in something like Kerbal you only started with a couple of basic parts, so you have like a rocket and you have like a fuel tank and you have maybe a scanner or something, um, but the idea is that you can leverage this to go through various science projects of your own creation to create more parts. So if you want to send people up into space, then you have to invent the uh, the person pod with its various pieces of air and controls and filters and stuff. And in order to invent this, you've got to do certain kinds of research in certain kinds of way. So you can also end up with a different product in the end with slightly different parameters because of the way that you do your research. And that would be equivalent to the difference between, say, Soviet... Uh, technology and American technology for keeping their uh, their astronauts alive, you have a different, uh, even though they accomplish the same basic task, they feel very different because they are implemented as a result of very different research programs and a very different final destination. The final prototypes and the final to market uh, goods, are, they all end up different because of the way that those are approached. So in order to get there, you might launch one of these guys into a specific orbit and then leave it there collecting data. So, you know, you put it into into this equatorial orbit and it produces a certain amount of science towards your needs to science per day. And then, uh, uh, or maybe your, your buddies launch a different, uh, same satellite, but on a different polar system. And that actually adds three seconds per day. And so they end up getting further along in the research, but you cut them off by uh, by deciding that you're going to, on the ground, have a couple of people 
your science team work on turning that into a product earlier so in the end you get your slightly crappy version and maybe they get a better version but much much later on because they're dealing with more science points which means it's a hard it's harder to take it to prototype which means it's harder to take it to final product um, and I think that this would provide a couple of much needed long-term play goals. I think this would provide you with a reason to have uh, star bases, a reason to have uh, moon bases, a reason to have long-range probes, because they would all provide different kinds of propellant and stabilizer for the science projects. And you can change your, your space station from working on one science project to working on another, and so on and so forth. And I think that this is a good idea, um, but it's also an idea that doesn't work with the prototype I worked so hard with. So uh, now I have to decide exactly what I'm going to do, whether I want to try and continue with the prototype I started on, or whether I want to try a new prototype. Well, anyhow, that's it.